So, uh, we've come to Prime Minister number nine. That was William Pitt, the first Earl of Chatham. Now, Pitt is often regarded to history as Pitt the Elder because his son would succeed him in later years as Prime Minister. And both Pitts were very influential figures and both are regarded among our top Prime Ministers. Um, Pitt the Elder is regarded as one of the top statesmen of the 18th century. Even though his total time in office um, was just about just over two years. Um, but in reality, one thing that needs to be pointed out about these early Prime Ministers is the time in office is not doesn't necessarily equate to the time they were influential. The way politics worked in the 18th century, it's often the case that they were influential, or not so, for a lot longer than uh, their time in office. And uh, quite often it was the case that the real power lay with someone else. And that was certainly the case with Pitt. A lot of the Prime Ministers before and after him were relatively obscure figures, and Pitt was the real power in government. So this is uh, some information about William Pitt from uh, the Downing Street website. Prime Minister for only two years, William Pitt the Elder dominated British politics in the middle of the 18th century. A wildly popular popular politician, his influence was so powerful that he effectively served as Prime Minister in all but name throughout the earlier premierships of the Duke of Newcastle and Lord Newcastle. Sorry, the Duke of Devonshire and Lord Newcastle. Pitt's greatest achievements, including the beginnings of the British Empire, were made before he took the role of PM himself. Pitt entered the uh, House of Commons in 1735 as a member of Parliament for Old Serum and became one of the so-called boy patriots who sought to bring down Sir, Charles, Sir Robert Walpole. He was an excellent public speaker and used his talents to launch constant attacks upon Walpole. Noted for his commanding figure and clear, dramatic voice, he was an intimidating opponent with unshakable self-belief and a way with witheringly sarcastic put-down. His career was defined by his refusal to toe the line especially over matters of war and commerce, on which he had strong views. His first campaign during Lord Newcastle's premiership was at his advocacy of war with rather than the appeasement of Spain. He also criticised the conduct of the war, first against Spain and then against France. He favoured a maritime war as tactically more astute, as well as the conquest of the French colonies. Pitt believed the poor conduct of the war was due to the monarch's attachment to Hanover, and to the resources and tactics being devoted to its protection. It is said that Pitt did not shirk from criticising the King's interests, despite the criticism it brought him and the delay it caused in his progression to a position of power. Britain's continuing military setbacks, however, gradually won all other parliamentarians around Pitt's view. The Prime Minister, Lord Newcastle, would have preferred to control Pitt by having him in government, but the King was deeply opposed to this. Continued defeats saw Pitt brought in the following year, 1745, as Paymaster General, an appointment intended to neutralise him. He married Lady Hester Grenville, sister of George Grenville, who was sympathetic, practical and stabilising influence. Pitt returned to Parliament in 1755, but his renewed attacks on military policy led to his dismissal. Yet continued defeats at France's hands appeared to support his opinions, and Lord Newcastle's government fell. Under the Duke of Devonshire, Pitt directed the war as Secretary of State. He used only British troops, he enlarged the navy, and he made friendly overtures towards Prussia. In 1757, Lord Newcastle returned as Prime Minister in a coalition which saw Pitt keep his position as Secretary of State. The government was a successful one, though it saw Pitt dismissed for a second, for a period of five months before being reinstated. During Lord Newcastle's premiership, Pitt made some of his greatest achievements in the area of foreign policy. He appreciated the relationship between war and trading success and chose his military campaigns to increase national trade. Conquering India, Canada, the West Indies and West Africa were all immensely beneficial to Britain's merchants. He was the first minister whose main strength lay in the support of the nation at large, as distinct from its representatives in the Commons, who recognised the importance of public opinion. In 1766 he was given the chance to form his own administration as Prime Minister, but he struggled to maintain sufficient support in the Commons. He made errors of judgement with uh, his appointments and with his acceptance of a peerage he became the Earl of Chatham. Pitt collapsed in the House of Lords in 1778 as his son William Pitt the Elder, sorry, William Pitt the Younger looked on and died four days later. His whole life had been scarred by hereditary diseases and mental illness.
by the way, his son also suffered from that. Um, so some personal facts about Pitt. He was born in 1708 at Westminster in London. He died in 1770 at Hayes and Winton, Middlesex at the age of uh, 69. He was in office from 1766 to 1768, but as I've pointed out, he was influential for much longer. He was a Whig, and some interesting facts about him. He's credited with the birth of the British Empire, and his common roots made him known as a great commoner. Uh, in other words, he didn't come from a peerage. Um, that was very unusual at the time, so the great commoner was something that uh, was a nickname sort of gained by his background. Um, Thomas argues, um, that's a historian I presume, argues that Pitt's power was based not on his family connections but by his extraordinary parliamentary skills by which he dominated the House of Commons. He displayed a commanding manner, brilliant rhetoric and sharp debating skills that cleverly, cleverly utilised broad literary and historical knowledge. Um, during his time in office, well actually up to his time in office I should say, uh, he was involved in numerous wars uh, such as the War of Jenkins Ear and the Seven Years War. Um, he died just before the American War of Independence, or I should say, um, in the middle of it, 1778. Um, some other things that uh, I can point out, he attended Trinity College, Oxford. Um, he was also involved in the Falklands Crisis of 1770 um, and the Corsican Crisis. And there's many, many things named, af named after William Pitt. These are just some of them. Chatham Street, Alaska. Chatham, New Hampshire. Chatham, New Jersey. Chatham County, Georgia. Pitt County, North Carolina. Chatham County, North Carolina. Chatham University. Pittsburgh, New Hampshire. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It was renamed, by the way, in his honor. It was originally f called Fort de, de Quesney. But Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania is probably the most famous place named after him. Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Pittsfield, New Hampshire. Pittsgrove Township, New Jersey. Pittstown, New Jersey. Pittston, Pennsylvania. Pens Pennsylvania County, Virginia. And its county seat, Chatham. Pittsburgh, North Carolina. Chatham Township in Quebec. Pittstown, New South Wales in Australia. Chatham, New South Wales in Australia. Chatham Island in Ecuador. Pitt Island in New Zealand. So um, there's a lot named in his honour. In his honour, and like uh, George Grenville, he was one of the Cobham's Cubs. So that is William Pitt, widely regarded as one of our top prime ministers, um, maybe the top prime minister of the mid 18th century.